Madam Chair and members of the commission, we are now live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the HPC hearing meeting for this evening. My name is Karen Burdett. I am the vice chair of the HPC. Uh, this is the November 16th, 2022 Historic Preservation Meeting. And just to satisfy legal requirements, I need to enter the following statement into the record. The commissioners and staff of the Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission are appointed by the county executive with the confirmation of the county council and are qualified to serve according to the chapter 24A, section 24A-4B of the Montgomery County Code. Resumes of the commissioners are on file at the Historic Preservation Office and are hereby made a part of the record by reference of all public hearings heard tonight. As is our custom, I would like our commission and staff to introduce themselves beginning on my left. Zara Nasser. Jeffrey Haynes. Mark Clements. Christina Arado. Julie Pelletier. Michael Galway. Rebecca Ballow, Historic Preservation Staff. And Dan Bruckert, Historic Preservation Staff. Thank you and welcome, and James. Oops, I'm sorry. This is <laughs> Commissioner Doman down in front. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Doman. Um, and I'd like to welcome Commissioner Galway to his first meeting of the HPC as a commissioner. Um, I need to remind, we're, we're going to go in a little bit different order tonight. Um, our agenda calls for a briefing of the Rustic Roads fun Functional Master Plan update first, but instead, if there's anybody here for the historic area work permits, we're going to move them first on the agenda. So I need to remind you that if you wish to testify, you must fill out a speaker's form on the table up here at the front of the room and give it to staff. Is there anybody here to speak to any of the hops tonight that needs to fill out a form? No? Okay. Um, have the historic area work permits been duly advertised? Uh, yes, they were advertised in the November 9th edition of the Washington Examiner. Okay. Okay. Um, Does anyone, oh, I've just asked that, but does anybody here need to speak to number 2A, 3706 Bradley Lane, Chevy Chase? 2B at 7125 Poplar Avenue, Tacoma Park? Number 2C at 7203 Holly Avenue, Tacoma Park? Number 2D at 5707 Surrey Street, Chevy Chase? Number 2E at 7500 Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park. Number 2G at 29 Philadelphia Avenue, Tacoma Park. And number 2H at 7819 Overhill Road, Bethesda. <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, hearing no objections, I move that we approve the following historic area work permits in accordance with staff reports based upon the record before us and in consideration of the recommendations of local advisory panels and including the conditions recommended by staff. Is there a second? Oops. Commissioner Clements, I second. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, we need to read the uh, list. I'm sorry, would you like to go ahead and read the list and we'll do this again. Uh, hop number one zero zero. Jeff, can you turn your mic real quick? Thanks. Hop number one zero zero eight two one eight at three seven zero six Bradley Lane, Chevy Chase. Hop number one zero zero nine seven two seven at seventy one twenty five Poplar Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number one zero one zero two zero seven at seventy two zero three Holly Avenue, Tacoma Park. Hop number one zero zero nine eight eight one at five seven zero seven Surrey Street, Chevy Chase. Hop number one zero one zero three two eight at seventy five hundred Carroll Avenue, Tacoma Park. 
pop number 1011214 at 29 Philadelphia Avenue, Tacoma Park, and hop number 1011306 at 7819 Overhill Road, Bethesda. Now, is there a second to this motion? This is Commissioner Clements, I second. All in favor say aye. 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 Commissioner Doman? Aye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for, uh, for making hops that are easy to approve. And the staff uh, will work with anybody who has any questions for the record. We've gone now to the briefing on the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan update, the briefing by planning department staff in advance of a planning board public hearing. Please come up and introduce yourselves. Good evening. For the record, this is Casey Roan, Historic Preservation Staff. And I'm Jamie Pratt from Up County Planning. And uh, Roberto Duke, also from the Up County uh, Division. Thank you. We're here to present a briefing on the ongoing update to the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan. Um, before Jamie and Roberto take over the bulk of the presentation, um, I wanted to briefly frame why we're here um, to discuss this plan. Uh, historic Preservation staff has been working closely with the Up County Planning Division for the past several years to update the 1996 Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan. The Planning Board will hold a public hearing on the update tomorrow night, and we want to offer you the opportunity to ask questions and make comments on the plan. We'll take your feedback tonight and uh, prepare to draft a letter to the Planning Board um, to submit your comments as part of the public record. It's been part of our work program for several years now to present these master plan updates to the Historic Preservation Commission, particularly where the plans involve uh, recommendations about historic uh, designations or where there are significant historical elements. In this case, the county's rustic roads program includes one road designated to the master plan for historic preservation. Uh, this is Martinsburg Road and many roads that are associated with designated historic sites and rural cultural landscapes. In some cases, like for uh, Rustic Buck Lodge Road, oops, Rustic Buck Lodge Road uh, seen here, historic resources or views of historic resources are identified as significant features that define the road's rustic character. So historic sites and historic research are woven throughout this plan document. After Jamie and Roberto share an overview of the plan update, I'll end with a little bit of a review of the historic preservation specific recommendations that we've made in the implementation section. Thank you. Okay. Um, rustic roads are, uh, roads are designated as rustic, uh, uh, designated for the rustic road program and have been determined uh, to have valuable characteristics and are to be preserved under Chapter 49 of the County Code. Uh, Article 8 uh, specifically created two classifications, rustic roads and exceptional rustic roads, and established the qualifying criteria for each classification. Maintenance practices and improvements must preserve the roads and certain significant features along those roads. Um, so specifically, uh, rustic roads are narrow, low volume roads where natural, agricultural, and or historic features are prominent. These roads have outstanding natural features along their edges, have vistas to farm fields, rural landscapes or buildings, and or provide access to historical resources and landscapes. Uh, rustic roads must be safe uh, for vehicles and pedestrians. A road may not be classified rustic if its function or safety is significantly impaired. 
an exceptional rustic road uh, contributes significantly to the characters of the county and has unusual features that would be more negatively affected by improvements. And here we have uh, Seneca Creek, which runs right along the edge of uh, Berryville Road, which is a fairly long road uh, in the program. Um, and so it has some very uh, significant features along the edges, so that's why it's uh, categorized as ex exceptional rustic. And briefly, I just wanted to go over a little bit of the background, uh, the timeline on rustic roads. Um, and I'll start with 1980, even though we have a few things before that. But in 1980, the County Council approved the functional master plan for the preservation of agricultural and rural open space, known as the Arrows Plan. Um, and with the Arrows Plan, the Agricultural Reserve was created, and there was a density of one house per 25 acres also created. And the Arrows Plan uh, conserved uh, conservation policies, protected farmland and agricultural areas, encompassing approximately 93,000 acres. Uh, along the county's northern, western, and eastern borders. But uh, that plan did not provide for the long-term prot protection of the roads that were within the agricultural reserve and some of the adjacent rural areas. In 1990, a task force was created to investigate long-term protections of the county's rural roads, leading to the creation of the Rustic Roads Program in 1993. And in 1996, the actual uh, Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan was compiled. So the 66 roads that were designated in that plan, and previously in, I think it was 1994, a number of roads were also designated rustic, uh, and those were incorporated. So again, this as... Um, Casey was uh, showing the 1996 Rustic Roads uh, Functional Master Plan built upon the Arrows Plan, designated roads to be classified as rustic or exceptional rustic, described the roads uh, designation in the uh, Functional Master Plan, and we'll get into the categories there uh, briefly, and only included, but it only included roads that were in the agriculture, at that time, only roads that were in the agricultural reserve and the lock roads along the Potomac River. With this uh, particular update, uh, the, that's 26 years later, um, we are, have two main purposes. Uh, it assesses the roads that have been nominated to the program, the new roads that have been nominated to the program, and completes incomplete descriptions of roads already in the program. So since 1996, there are a number of roads through various master plans that have been added to the program. Um, in some cases, they have complete descriptions, so they tell about the, the history of the road, um, the traveling experience along the road. Uh, they talk, it talks about uh, the road characteristics and those types of things, but in some cases, that wasn't uh, done. It was just suggested, well, it was just told that these roads should be classified as either rustic or exceptional rustic. So this plan is, is updating and providing all those designations. Um, so the plan also considers reclassifications of some existing um, rustic roads, so going from rustic to exceptional rustic. It also changes the extents of some roads. We'll look at that and updates, uh, again, the existing road descriptions and recommends, recommends changes to significant features, um, potentially since it's been 26 years uh, since the entire plan was looked at. And except for one road, um, and hopefully I can use the pointer here to uh, show this, uh, except for one road, which is um, right here, uh, that's Game Preserve Road. All the roads in uh, the program are in the upcounty area. So you see this little pink line and that goes around all the outer edges of the county. Um, this is called the upcounty area. And all of the, most of the roads, or all of the roads except one, are in the um, upcounty area. The rustic roads also border three municipalities. Um, 
Gaithersburg, Poolsville, and Brookville that have independent planning and zoning powers and are not included within Montgomery County master plans. The segments of the roads that run through the town of Barnesville, which also has a independent planning and zoning authority, are included with the Rustic Roads program at the request of the town, both with the 1996 uh, Rustic Roads master plan and with this update. So I will briefly go through the chapters of the Rustic Roads Functional Master Plan that are part of the public hearing draft that will we be um, uh, holding a, a hearing on, uh, getting public comments on uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, first, there's an introduction, and this provides, in the introduction, we provide a vision statement uh, regarding uh, rustic and exceptional rustic roads, or so a, a vision of the, of the uh, Rustic Roads uh, program. So I just want to read this. Uh, rustic and exceptional rustic roads are historic and scenic roadways that reflect the agricultural culture and rural origins of the county. In addition to being an integral part of the agricultural transportation network, rustic roads provide the county with opportunities for heritage tours and economic development. Preserving rustic roads is an important way to relay the county's history to future generations. The land uses along rustic roads are not to, expected to significantly change. The significant features of rustic and exceptional rustic roads, the views to adjacent farmlands, rural open spaces, and natural features surrounding the roads, and the historic and cultural resource near the roads continue to be preserved for county residents and visitors to enjoy and explore. Rustic roads provide safe and scenic access to existing and future businesses that support agritourism industries such as farm to markets, orchards, wineries, breweries, and farm to table businesses that continue to evolve in the rural parts of the county. So there's also uh, a section that talks about uh, the road characteristic or road characteristics of these roads. And as roads are being preserved and maintained or service, uh, serviced, care must be given to preserve the character of the landscape elements along the roads. These features include the narrowness of the roads and the natural drainage along the roads and the preservation of environmental, uh, of landscape elements along roadways. And here we have a view of a Sugarloaf Mountain Road near the intersection of two rustic roads, Comus and Peachtree Roads. And just so you can see the rolling topography and how the, the road itself uh, follows that topography and then views, of course, towards Sugarloaf Mountain. Many of the bridges along rustic roads have been identified as significant features. Uh, generally, the design is far more attractive and more appropriate to these type of roads than new construction would be. Bridge designs that are aesthetically acceptable and loud and allow for the movement of agricultural equipment and vehicles are needed along rustic roads. And you can see there's a one lane bridge, uh, timber bridge along the mouth of Monocacy and a, a, another one lane bridge across uh, Great Seneca Creek uh, at uh, uh, Black Rock Road. These significant features are those elements that give each rustic road its unique uh, character and need to be preserved even as the roads are being maintained and improved. Um, please note that the improvements do not preclude improvements to promote safety or the movement of farm vehicles. Um, this one is showing uh, Bell Cote Road, an exceptional rustic road in the eastern portion of the county uh, that is very, a very narrow width. Uh, as the, and shows the road as it winds along um, through the landscape and through the tree canopy and as it crosses uh, a small creek area. So with each uh, rustic road, we have shown a table within the, the plan itself uh, that provides a summary of why the road is considered um, rustic or exceptional rustic. And there are six criteria for uh, rustic roads um, in, the, in the plan, and it shows how each road meets certain criteria. And then for exceptional rustic, 
there are another three criteria. So a road has to be a rust, uh, rustic in order to meet the exception, uh, in order to be an exceptional rustic road. Equity. So as we were um, going through the previous plan, um, each road profile contains historic information about the road and sites along the roads, including details about early inhabitants. New histories written for the uh, road designations without uh, new roads, um, sorry, new histories have been written for roads designated without, uh, previously designated without road descriptions or and these new, not, uh, not, uh, newly nominated roads provide an opportunity to bring forward underrepresented themes and communities and to utilize knowledge gained through historic preservation research uh, completed since the original plan was adopted. New histories highlight themes of women's history, African American individual and communities, and social activism, and created opportunities for more people to see themselves uh, and their communities reflected through these roads. Uh, and during the process, planning staff also reviewed existing road descriptions and flagged profiles uh, with potentially dated language. And these updates were uh, made to ensure that the language aligned with difficult sub uh, subjects. And the guidance we used was uh, through, uh, from the National Park Service and leading historical uh, institutions. This is Casey Rohn again. I'm just going to share a couple of examples of the type of updates that Roberto mentioned. So in terms of updating the language, we went through the existing plan document and flagged a number of roads that included uh, descriptions that were written in ways that we would no longer talk about some of these difficult subjects, um, particularly as they related to the history of slavery in the county. So one example of that was the um, description of Westerly Road which in the 1996 plan, as you can see here, uh, described Elijah Veers White as a Civil War military commander and local hero. Um, and in fact, Elijah Veers White uh, fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War and in previous battles to uphold the institution of slavery, which was personally beneficial to himself and his family. So we wanted to go back and, and take another look at this and add a bit of additional context about White and about his family property at Stony Castle for people reading this plan today. We also um, had the opportunity to write new historical narratives, not just update the existing. And this allowed us to bring in some of those new themes that better reflect the diversity of the county. Uh, for example, we added additional content on the landscape of African-American educational institutions along exceptional rustic white ground road in Boyd's. Um, and we were able to highlight the legacy of early women conservationists along Game Preserve Road in Gaithersburg. And so as Roberta mentioned, this result is a plan that is much more reflective of sort of the, the range of experiences and diversity of the county. Um, so after the introductory chapter, we um, have a section on the recommendations uh, the broad recommendations in the plan where we've broken the roads into several categories. So out of the nominated roads, um, we are recommending that 17 of the nominated rustic roads be, um, be designated, in fact, rustic or exceptional rustic. Um, there's six nominated roads that we did not recommend as rustic. Uh, many times it was because they didn't qualify um, just based on not being a public road. But in other cases, we didn't find that they met all of the necessary criteria. Um, there are 33 roads that are existing rustic roads that had no um, major changes. Uh, we still reviewed the language in those, um, but we didn't have to make any um, non-technical updates really. Uh, there are 15 roads where we're recommending an extent change. So the portion of the road that is rustic isn't always the entire road. Sometimes it starts at a certain intersection or a, a certain point along the road. And in a few cases, we're shortening it just a little bit because institutions at one end of the other might make it, um, it, it's lost its rustic character along those portions of the road in a few cases. 
And in a, a few cases, we're also designating slightly more of the road be rustic than was previously designated. Uh, there are 24 um, new road profiles written for the existing rustic roads that were made rustic in the area master plans but didn't have full descriptions. And then we have 31 roads where we're um, revising the significant features, which are those features that must be protected when the road, when maintenance is done along those roads. And then there are 16 roads where the classification change from rustic to exceptional rustic. Uh, two roads are being removed from the program uh, with this update. Um, so after the recommendations, we show the recommendations per road um, as a summary, uh, and we have some symbols that we're using, uh, you'll see them here, that kind of correspond to the type of recommendation for that road. So if you're looking for a certain category of recommendation, you can glance through the list and get that. Um, and so in the end, we are recommending 115 uh, rustic roads. Currently there are 99, uh, so there would be 115 after this update, and then there's eight roads discussed in this plan that were not recommended. Uh, as part of this, um, uh, you'll see here on the screen that rustic roads by code must be low volume, and they must have a history of vehicle and pedestrian accidents that don't suggest unsafe conditions. Uh, so there's no specific traffic volume or crash rate uh, that's considered inappropriate, but in 1996 they used 3,000 average weekday trips as kind of a guideline for what might be considered low volume and, um, and they looked at all the roads that had eight or more reported accidents in a five-year period. And this one, we, um, we looked, we were able to get the crash location data for all the crashes over the last six years in our county. So we used um, all of the crashes and created individual maps to show where those crashes occurred as part of this analysis. Um, and so then, um, all this research and, and uh, analysis led to the final road profiles, which we um, we used the 1996 format and just uh, updated a little bit. We added an environment section, uh, but we've updated every one of the maps, which used to be kind of simple black and white line drawings, and we are showing historic features, view sheds, uh, cemeteries, uh, parks, um, there's numerous <laughs> items are able to be shown in color that weren't able to be shown in black and white because it just would have been too messy. Um, we're also including pictures for all of the roads in the program. Uh, and as part of this outreach effort, we have uh, an online feedback form on our website as well as a interactive map where you can click through and look at all of the road profiles and uh, submit, as well as the recommendations for those roads. And then you could submit comments on those roads through this profile. Um, we only printed six copies total of the road profiles because it's um, currently 400 pages and we don't have photos for all the roads yet. Uh, so we, um, this viewer here is a, a much more uh, ecologically friendly, I suppose, way of viewing the roads. And it's nice to be able to see where the roads are on the map as you're looking at the profile. And you can see what roads are around the other roads. And, and here they're an alphabetical listing. So there is a location map for each road, but it's still nice to be able to see it on the online map. Uh, and the final chapter of the plan is our implementation and next steps where we um, we started out with a context of the um, implementation section. Uh, so regardless of their classification, roads in the county must be maintained in a manner that provides safe travel for all modes. Additionally, many roads in the up county area and more specifically in the agricultural reserve need to provide for the adequate movement of farm equipment. So this chapter contains recommendations and suggested next steps to ensure the continued successful implementation of the program in accordance with county code. 
Uh, the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee is a county executive agency group that has a special role in overseeing the Rustic Roads program. Uh, the roles and duties of the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee are outlined in the same chapter 49, Article 8, that defines what a rustic road is in the first, in the first place. So as you can see here, they, their um, roles are to promote awareness of the program, to review and comment on the classification of roads in the program, to review and comment on executive regulations and other county policies and programs that may affect the program. And uh, every other year, they are to provide a report to the executive council and planning board. Um, so there are seven members of the committee. Three of them are farmer members. Um, uh, two represent civic associations. One has knowledge of um, roadway engineering techniques, and one is a historic preservation uh, specialist on the committee. Uh, so we have 25, I think, recommendations in the plan. Uh, I'm not going to go through them, uh, but um, they, the first one that we think is the most important at the top here shows stakeholder meetings. And um, this is just to get, uh, to try to uh, ensure better communication between the um, Montgomery County Department of Transportation, which maintains the roads, the Office of Agriculture, which represents the farmers who use these roads, um, and the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee, who um, advises on uh, matters related to these roads. So we, we just want to make sure that these groups are all talking together at the same time um, to make sure that the program is continues to be successful. And um, I'm going to turn it back over to Casey for the historic preservation recommendations part of the plan. Thank you, Jamie. So, you know, a lot of historic research went into this plan, and we spent a lot of time looking at the historic resources along the roads. And we came up with um, five recommendations of ways we thought that the work that we began with this update could be continued going forward. Um, so those are on pages 90 through 92 of the um, actual plan um, document. Um, and I'm just going to sort of review them at a, at a high level. And there's, there's more detail included in the plan itself. Uh, so the first recommendation was to promote awareness of the rustic roads as historic and cultural resources and assets for heritage tourism in the county. And so each recommendation has some supportive actions identified underneath of it. And so these really related to interpretive strategies to highlight the roads through public art, um, through books, publications, historic markers, and events, including events in cooperation with our heritage and agritourism programs. Um, we also recommended integrated wayfinding si signage and bicycle tours that brought together um, these resources with a lot of synergy, our historic sites, ag sites, and the rustic roads. The, let's see, next recommendation was to um, initiate a limited master plan amendment to update the road profiles to better reflect the breadth and diversity of Montgomery County's history and to expand the analysis of rustic roads within historic and cultural landscapes. So for the scope of this update, we wrote new narratives for the plan for the roads that had been designated without them and for the newly nominated roads, but we did not go back and do an extensive revision and update of many of the roads that were already designated to the program. So that's the gist of this recommendation. We think the same effort should be applied to all of the roads included in the program. Uh, we also think that the um, update should make sure that our burial sites, which is a new program that didn't e exist at the time of the original plan, to make sure those are integrated into the road's significant features, road history, and travel experiences. Um, some of the rustic roads are very directly related to our burial sites. Um, we think there's a need to reevaluate the county's historically black communities for potential rustic roads. Um, and to continue identifying ways to bring in these new themes and sites that um, reflect even through the recent past, such as the civil rights movement. 
the next recommendation was to formalize the recognition of rustic roads as historic resources by completing a historic context study and listing these roads in local, state, and national inventories of historic places. So obviously some of these roads are recognized in the plan for their historic value, but they're not necessarily identified with the state or in the National Register as historic resources. And we know that that level of recognition would offer them greater protection. Uh, so this recommends developing a comprehensive historic context of the history of county road building that would allow us to better identify which roads are significant for potential historic designation. There's potential that more of these roads could be added to the master plan or nominated to the National Register. A number of these roads also run through existing National Register historic districts, so those forms should be updated to reflect the significance of these roads. Um, and finally, to complete MIHP forms for roads and bridges that have been called out for their historic value to make sure that they're recognized by the state. Uh, next was to support any future phases of the Streets and Parks Facilities Renaming Review Project. So if the uh, any future phases of this project are initiated, staff will evaluate um, if directed whether any rustic roads should be considered for potential renaming. And finally, uh, we recommended the um, promotion of inclusive and equitable access to the rustic roads as historic and cultural resources for the public. So many of these roads are in rural areas. They require, um, you know, not everyone has the means to access these roads, especially for people lacking a you know, personal vehicle. So in any way that we can to encourage our partner organizations to provide transportation options, to bring people in who may not live in the upcounty area and have as easy access to these roads, and also through our own office to plan and promote events that celebrate the diverse county history found along these roads so that people you know, see themselves um, in these events that we're planning. Um, that's the last uh, historic preservation recommendation. So I think at this point, um, I want to thank you for listening to all of that and um, allow you to ask any questions or provide any comments with the goal in mind of sort of formulating um, comments that we can uh, submit to the, the planning board um, as part of the public record. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions regarding the rustic road? Up to Commissioner Pellet here. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about it was something that you said early on about the the interaction with the what am I trying to say the parts of the county that have their own um, I don't know the I don't know if it's zoning or their own planning like areas in place like Poolsville and um, like how does this work? with them or does it or do they honor this like can you sort of talk about the interaction with those municipalities sure this one well within um again uh thanks With the exception of, uh, of uh, Barnesville, um, the other municipalities uh, where rustic roads run through, so for example, Poolsville right here, they have the independent uh, planning and, and zoning authority. So MNC PPC uh, doesn't, um, has, doesn't have jurisdiction over, over those uh, municipalities. But in the case of uh, Barnesville, uh, they requested that any of the roads running through the, the towns themselves, um, the town itself, would be included within the program. Um, so if you can look closely at, like, say, for example, Poolsville right here, uh, there are roads that run along the edge of the town, but nothing within the town itself is included uh, in the Rustic Roads uh, master plan which is different from the, the town of Barnesville itself because they specifically requested that their roads be, roads that they thought should be in the program be included, the full extent of the road be included in the program. Okay, so the, so the county 
this uh, Chapter 49, Article 8, that's the county code, right? Yes. But that doesn't apply to places that have their own government, <laughs> whatever, right? Like, so, so you can't trump Poolsville with this, or I don't know if it's an ordinance or if it's more of a protective thing, but so, so they can say we don't want to participate. And, th and that's okay. So they're not required to buy into this. I wouldn't say that, you know, it's, it's like that, that they're not, that they don't buy into it. It's uh, just with the, the planning and zoning authority. So w what our purview, we, we don't have control over anything within those, in those uh, municipalities. Oh, okay. Whereas, um, I guess 26 years ago, when the initial plan was uh, created, um, the town of Barnesville specifically asked to be included within the, the plan itself, the, the roads uh, themselves. I mean, there are certain roads that are, of course, there's a, certain roads are state roads, so the right. uh, state highway would have administered those particular roads uh, and everything. And they would have uh, jurisdiction over, you know, how everything's handled. Okay, I see. So is Chapter Forty Nine, Article Eight? I haven't read it, but is it a, is it like a protective uh, ordinance, or is it informational, or is it like Chapter Twenty Four, where historic districts have to, you know, comply with certain. Things like it, I, I'm trying to figure out how the the rustic roads how it's, and I don't know if I want to say enforced, but you know what I mean. It, like yeah, I mean, Chapter Forty Nine contains definitions of what a rustic road is uh, and how one can become designated as rustic, and um, and what what it means for it to be rustic as far as preserving the significant features, and then there is a separate part of the um, executive regulations that further define how the Montgomery County Department of Transportation has to maintain the roads that are in the program. And that's also in county code. If you dig down to the regulation section instead of the code section. Um, so okay. the, the definite and the definition of the rustic roads advisory committee is, is in there. Um, I suppose the Poolsville could, designate their own rustic roads under 49 if they so chose. Right. But we okay. can't designate them for Poolsville. And I, okay. I think it would be accurate to say that the county code outlines the criteria for what makes a rustic road, but it is our master plan that actually designates the roads as rustic, and our plans don't apply to those municipalities, so therefore they're right. not, they can't be designated through the master plan. Okay. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? Question. Yes, this is Commissioner Doman. If I may be able to speak remotely. Please do. Um, I found this rustic road program, uh, I didn't know anything about it until this came up for the meeting. And over the weekend, I took the time to drive up to the upper county into the agricultural preserve area. And I was uh, really impressed. I I didn't know these roads even existed. So, so we, uh, but they're not easy to find. I mean, I guess they're easy to find. Your maps are very well laid out and everything. They're not the main roads. I've traveled through the county, upper county, but usually on the main highways, and these are off the main highways. You have good signage. I realize that the, the little sign that designates a road has an a indicator on it that it's a rustic road. I thought that's great help. Um, but they're very interesting. But but I have the, the privilege of having a car and I can drive around and I can take the time to find these things. They're a little bit difficult, I think, sometimes to find the roads and um, people that don't have access to a car, this would be pretty much something they could never do, could never visit this. And um, the one thing that I really liked, I did, uh, I drove down West Old Baltimore Road that actually has a, a stream crossing, a ford, if you may be exact on this thing, in which case you drive down an incline, and it's a little sign that says stream crossing ahead, 
and you cross through the water with your car and you come up the other side. And I thought that was, I never drove my car through a stream before. So I thought that was really a unique feature that I, you know, I think it's worth a trip up if you can just do that, you know? So I give you guys a lot of credit. I think this is a, this is a good program, but I also think it's kind of um, not easily accessible to a lot of people that live in the county. A lot of people will never ever see this because you actually need transportation and you need a half a day or four hours to do the roads if you want to see anything. So it's a good program, but very limited, I think, participation. So that's my comment. Thank, Thank you, you Commissioner Doman. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, and I'll. The first one would be kind of related to Commissioner Doman's comment about accessibility. Have you coordinated with any of the local historic districts up in the region where the rustic roads are um, to develop bus tours through or, or guided tours through the area? Um, I know that uh, in the, I guess in the past, uh, I would say about a year ago, we, as we were working on this plan, uh, we worked with Heritage Montgomery. Mm -hmm. uh, they're developing a tourist uh, a map showing uh, different routes or tourist routes uh, folks can take uh, to enjoy the roads. Mm -hmm. um, and so we worked with them uh, just in helping to, I guess, start the beginnings of a, of a tourist map where people could enjoy it. Um, in terms of bus tours, it, in, in some cases, it may be a little difficult, but, you know, it'd have to be a smaller bus of, of sorts, and I don't know exactly how that would be handled. Uh, you know, um, so, some buses do already uh, travel some of these roads, uh, you know, one's by Butler's Orchard, and I know there, there are school tours that go there and, and that sort of thing. So there have been, you know, opportunities for that, that type of thing. So to kind of enjoy the roads themselves and some of the features off the roads and, and places. Um, you know, I think this is an evolving, continue to evolving mm -hmm. program. Um, and so as the, the program ages, you know, more opportunities are, are presented. Um, you know, especially for the agritourism, and I forgot to, to mention on one of the roads, uh, uh, Montevideo Road right here. Um, in this case, you have uh, the Rocklands uh, Farm Winery mm -hmm. right there, so that is promoting, you know, tourists and everything, and, and um, you also have just really, you show the, agri the actual agricultural farmlands and the the actual uh, wineries, and so it promotes all different uh, things, and also many of these roads also are, are used heavily by bikers uh, mm. too. Um, that's one of the reasons that in the 1996 plan it talks about a driving experience, and we changed that to a traveling experience, um, mm. so that we promote you know different types of uh, modes of travel. Thank you. Um, I was recently driving up around Comus and happened to be driving down one of the rustic roads and I caught the sign, saw the sign and thought this is what this is all about and they are beautiful roads um, and I'm familiar with uh, Rockland's winery, farm winery. It's a nice place to go and it was our first, my first um, excursion um, once we got out of lockdown was to enjoy the day up there. Um, you might consider um, when something I'm sure you don't even want to think about, but um, an audio version that someone could link to in their car um, while they're driving, because the person who's driving can't look at the map. Um, now, my last question is more of a concerning question, is um, for the roads, and more particular, the bridges up along these roads, is there ever, is there a risk that DOT will come along and say, we want to modernize this road with some infrastructure money and how are the bridges actually protected along these roads um well that's a that's a, a question that has 
caused a lot of debate um, mm -hmm. because um, the rustic roads uh, must be safe. And sometimes when there's a one lane bridge, MCDOT um, may not consider them safe in that configuration and push for a two lane bridge. So then there's arguments as to whether that's the only solution or can we do other things mm -hmm. to make them safe while retaining their current um, one lane configuration. So part of those meetings that we're hoping to have with DOT and the Rustic Roads Advisory Committee would be how to settle uh, a question like that. Um, the bridge on the top here is a, a recent, somewhat recent uh, replacement of an existing bridge and MCDOT was able to do it um, in much the same style as the original. It's a timber decked uh, bridge. It's one lane wide. Um, so it is possible, um, but it, it, it's a tricky question, so it's hard for me to answer uh, one way or the other. Um, but a lot of road bridges have been designated as significant features, which does mean that they should be maintained in that same configuration unless some overriding safety concern leads, it, leads to a different decision. Thank you. Um, are there any questions, remaining questions? Commissioner Galloway. I've got one question. Roberto, in one of your slides, you were showing going from rustic to exceptional, and there was three categories on this slide. Um, and I was curious, um, in, in one of the examples, I don't remember, there was only one check mark. So is it that if any one of those particular categories happen to apply, I mean, we've, you've recommended a number of of rustic roads go to exceptional, but, but it, and it's not all three categories are checked. So just out of curiosity, is it one of the three? Is it all the three? Is it how, how do you actually? Um, it, it's, it's it's not intuitive to me how you may recommend it based on yeah this is the one here. So if you go down, you have the uh, is it uh, Batson Road? I guess it is. So is that being recommended for exceptional because of one of the categories being no, fulfilled? No, it, it, it has to meet all three to okay. be exceptional. So you'll see um, next to Batson Road that there's an R here instead of an E. So Batson Road doesn't, it meets one of the criteria for an exceptional rustic road, but it has to meet all three, whereas, and then here's another one, Black Rock, that's got two of them. That's not enough. Okay. Um, but Berryville has three, so that's an exceptional rustic road. Okay, so the same goes for so, rustic as so well. So for the rustic, it only needs to meet one of them. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. But for exceptional rustic, it has to be a rustic road, and it has to meet all three of these criteria. So it might be good to clarify that in, in, in the document. Okay. Thank you. All right, I think, um, thank you very much for this presentation. It's been very interesting and informative, and I'm sure we'll all be out exploring the roads now on our own. Um, and your next steps are from this point? Uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. we have a public hearing to hear testimony on the public hearing draft of the plan. Uh, we'll leave the public record open for 10 days to a week, uh, two weeks. Um, it'll probably be two weeks. And after that, we compile all the comments um, and respond to them and set up work sessions with the planning board to take the public hearing draft and the recommended changes and, and see which changes mm -hmm. um, are going to be implemented in the what would then be called the planning board draft. So we might have one work session, we might have two, we're not sure yet. Um, after we've seen and heard all the testimony, we'll know more about that. That will probably be in January uh, and then after we've had the work sessions, then we create that planning board draft that the planning board then has to approve and send to county council. Mm -hmm. County council has their own public hearing and work sessions. Um, and then they approve the plan with revisions. So they have a, a long uh, list of, of what they might, or hopefully it's a very short list, but it could be a long list of changes <laughs> based on what they hear from the public at their own work sessions. And so then we take their revisions and implement them, and the commission will then adopt them. 
As far as next steps for the Historic Preservation Commission, the staff will follow up within that 10-day um, to two-week period in which the public record is open to see if you'd like to submit a letter to the Planning Board formalizing some of your comments on the plan. Madam Chair, this is Rebecca Ballow for the record. Um, I would suggest that if the HPC would like to submit comments mm -hmm. that you make a motion stating that um, directing the staff to start drafting a letter and then that gives us the opening to, to go back and forth with you to draft such a letter with any comments that you have to send to the mm -hmm. planning board within the window. Thank you, Supervisor Ballow. Um, I think then we need to make a motion that um, I make a motion that the um, HPC draft a letter of our comments to send to the planning board related to any questions or comments that we have on this update to the Rustic Roads plan. Do I have a second? It's Commissioner Haynes, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Well, thank you very much, Mr. Duke, Mr. Pratt, and Ms. Roan, very much for this presentation. It's always nice to have a positive improvement and, and historic preservation in this county. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on, we are going to move on to uh, item three, the preliminary consultations. The first one is 3A at 15911 Redland Road at Durwood. And we have two uh, applicants testify or uh, Applicants testifying today, Lawrence Smith and Michael Grieg, the architect. Madam and Chair, there is a staff report for this item. Oh, I am, I apologize. Um, yes, would the staff like to present its report, please? Briefly, yes. So thank you. This is a preliminary consultation for 15911 Redland Road in Durwood for the master plan historic site known as the Durwood Store and Post Office. So I have some brief site information for you. So the map shows the designated environmental setting for the site it is outlined in pink. The property is addressed at Redland Road, however, it is physically located at the corner of Chieftain Avenue and Durwood Road. The, the building was constructed circa 1904. Again, it is an individual master plan historic site designated as such by the County Council in 2021. The standards of review for the HOP as well as for um, this preliminary consultation are Chapter 24A, the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, and then other relevant master plan guidance. The most recent master plan would be the 2021 Shady Grove Minor Master Plan Amendment. So to help guide your discussion, again, because this is a prelim, this is not an exhaustive presentation. I know that the board is familiar with the standards in 24A as well as the, as well as the Secretary of the Interior Standards, but I did want to bring to your attention some specific information about the adaptive reuse that was in the 2021 plan. So this, this language is taken directly from the plan, and I have these slides here to help guide your discussion. Um, so it talks about how in May of 2019, the HPC recommended the designation of this property, and the HPC also supported rezoning the property to an appropriate residential zoning category to allow for its adaptive reuse and restoration. So going back to the 2006 sector plan, that plan had recommended that the property be rezoned to the PD-22 zone to allow for reuse and renovation of the building. So adaptive reuse of this site has been long envisioned and supported by the planning board and the county council. At that time, the idea was to allow up to six residential units within the existing structure. Um, but then the 2014 zoning ordinance rewrite eliminated the PD zones, including the PD-22. And so then the 2021 sector plan had to come up with a, a new commercial mixed use residential zone that might be appropriate for this site. The first iteration of the plan that came out of the planning board recommended the CRN zone. 
However, in further discussions with the applicant and with the county council, the council ultimately recommended a rezoning from the R200 to the CRT1 CO, C0.25 R1.0 H50 zone um, to permit the building's historic adaptive reuse renovation and to allow for a minimal amount of commercial density to fulfill the requirements of the optional method of development of the CRT zone. There were some recommendations about an appropriate non-residential uses. This property was a general store and post office from the time of its construction. So the plan envisioned some similar type of neighborhood serving you know, retail use, retail commercial use to be integrated with the residential development. The plan encouraged a range of unit types that could be incorporated into new construction. New construction was always envisioned to happen on this site in coordination with the adaptive reuse of the structure. The plan specifically mentioned, as you can see, duplexes and small cottages, but the, those were not meant to be, the use of those terms were not meant to be a limiting factor on what could be constructed or redeveloped on the site. And the council also approved flexibility to development standards, including waiving some standards of the zone um, that would permit preservation and reuse of the building. And I'll let the applicant speak some more to some of those. Some of them have to do with setback requirements, parking, um, stormwater management, and the sidewalks. And the council specifically directed that uh, to allow on-site parking requirements to be partially met with on-street parking because this is such an exceptionally constrained property. So this property has a long history <laughs> with Montgomery County that I, I wanted to highlight for the commission, dating all the way back to 1976, where the planning board listed the larger Durwood Historic District to the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites. So that was with the, the first batch of significant properties in Montgomery County to be protected on the Locational Atlas. The whole Durwood Historic District was included. In 1984, the HPC recommended that the Historic District be listed to the Master Plan for Historic Preservation. Six years later, in 1990, the County Council took up this question, and the County Council did not concur with the HPC, and in fact, they removed the Durwood Historic District from the Locational Atlas. As part of that motion, the Council did designate the Crab Family Cemetery as an individual Master Plan Historic Site. In 2004, so then there was about 50, 15 years, but the community in Durwood remained you know, very steadfastly committed to preserving historic structures and preserving the history of old Durwood. So when the Shady Grove sector plan that was eventually adopted in 2006 came up for review, the neighborhood, um, the advocates in the neighborhood came back to the HBC, came back to the planning board to request that the Durwood store and post office be listed as an individual site to the locational atlas. And that action was supported and included in the 2006 Shady Grove sector plan. Fast forward another 13 years to 2019 when we were in the planning stages for the new Shady Grove Minor Master Plan Amendment. In 2019, the HPC recommend, recommended that the Durwood Store and Post Office be designated as an individual master plan historic site. And in 2021, the council designated the building as a master plan historic site with the entirety of its parcel being the environmental setting. In the designation report for the building, staff called out several defining characteristics, um, both of the, the architecture of the building and then important social cultural aspects of the site. The building is architecturally significant as a representative example of a typical turn of the century general store. Character defining features include the two story front gable form and the front porch. The wood siding and stamped, stamped tin roof contribute positively to the character of the building. And then culturally, the building is the oldest remaining commercial building in Old 
Durwood, which is a significant postal area, and it was a significant manufacturing hub in Montgomery County at the turn of the, of the 19th to the 20th century. The site is also significant for its contribution to women's history, including the legacy of Durwood's three female postmasters, who served for a total of 17 years combined, and the history of these women are not recorded at any other sites in Montgomery County. So the proposal this evening, the applicant proposes a comprehensive rehabilitation of the historic building, construction of a new three-story addition presented as options A, B, and C, and then with associated hardscape alterations and regrading. You can see from the information in the staff report that I, I gave you information about alterations that have occurred to the historic building, some limited demolition and restoration work that had already happened when it was listed to the locational atlas. But the presentation tonight and the report did not go into the plans for comprehensive rehabilitation so much. We, we are here tonight and I would recommended the applicant come forward to you this evening to really receive direction about their three options for the new building that they are looking to construct because their next steps from here will be to file for a preliminary plan and then ultimately site plan approval from the planning board. So this is a case where we may have several check-ins at the preliminary consultation phase, but I felt that this, this was a good time for them to receive your direction about the site design. So questions this evening for the HPC to consider. You may have many questions, but these are the ones that I focused on in the staff report, and we can come back to this at any time during the discussion. So is the overall site plan massing height and size of the addition appropriate? Which option, A, B, or C, should the applicant develop for preliminary and site plan submittal? If one option is chosen, are there comments that would aid in the development of an appropriate design? And what is the range of acceptable materials for the addition? For example, are substitute materials such as hardy plank and AZEC generally acceptable? So before I go to questions, I wanted to, well, that is not mine, sorry. <laughs> one moment. I wanted to pull up the applicant, this is the staff report, and then the applicant has their own presentation that I will share out. But we do have this available, so this is a picture of the site dating back to the 1970s. There are a number of buildings here. Um, I hope that everybody did get a chance just to re-familiarize yourself with the designation report. We have a lot of really wonderful photos from when the the warehouses were here, the silos were here. There were some buildings in between the Durwood store and the railroad tracks. There was an entire you know manufacturing commercial little hub here, which is now gone. And this building is is the last vestige of that community. So this so we don't know when it was turned into apartments. We suspect in the 1970s, um, the postmaster did live on the property, but again, it, at some point in the 1970s, each of these these doors here and then here, it, it was turned into individual apartments and the floor plates were sort of um, chopped up and cut up. This was the condition of the building in 2018, 2019, when staff started to work on the designation report. These are pictures showing the limited demolition that staff approved when the property was going through the designation process when it was on the locational atlas but not yet designated as a master plan site. We approved the demolition of the 1950s rear addition and this also allowed the applicant to really shore up the foundation and deal with some issues of deterioration at the historic building itself. So this is generally how it, it looks today, and the applicant provided a number of photos. They have replaced the stamped tin shingle roof in kind. They have re removed the asbestos shingle siding. They have retained some of the wood lap siding that seems to be in good condition, and the rest of the exterior is shored up with zip board, and there's the shell inside. So I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. The applicant will go through their presentation with the sidewalk, the historic building here, the new addition planned here, parking in the rear, small seating area, and then stormwater management facilities. Again, this is located at the corner of Chieftain and Durwood with a public alley in the rear. 
I'm just going to zip through these really, really quickly. We can go back to any of this during the course of the applicant's presentation. But I did just want to talk briefly about how staff looked at each of these conceptual options. So we've got options A, B, and C. And I tried to describe as best I could in the staff report what they've essentially done is taken the, the mass and form of this very simple rural general store and flipped it, flipped it perpendicular to the street, and then replicated the mass, you know, one, two, three, right next to each other, but not each of the elevations match. So for example, this is, this is meant to be the, the facade of this new building next to the side elevation of the Derwood store. And I pointed out in the staff report, but it bears repeating that there will be an open connecting stairway between the buildings, but it was not shown in the renderings uh, for the benefit, I think, of the commission so that you would have kind of an unobstructed view of, of what this elevation might look like. So what this does is it takes the mass, repeats it, and then pulls it, you know, pulls it up, apart as it moves down the street and then fractures the roof line as, as well, you know, pulling the ridge line up in this kind of repetitive pattern. So it's, it's taking a, a little bit more of a modern look at how the massing could work. And I will definitely let the project architect go into this in, in much more detail in case I am, I'm butchering a little bit what his intent was with this. And then this is, <clears throat> this is the rear elevation that faces the alley. And then this is their proposed side elevation that faces the interior lot line. So then option B here is a flat roof option that keeps the same um, kind of sawtooth pattern going down the street with the elevation, but again has a, has a flat roof and a cornice. And we can get into a discussion of materials as well, but I really just wanted to focus on the design to start. And then option C is almost a quieter version, I would describe it, of, of option A because it does not use color in the same way. In, in option A, there's, you know, it's like an A, B, A, B, A, B pattern with the color, um, further, further breaking up that elevation. And then here, each of the three distinct um, massings have their own color that unifies them in a different way. So staff thinks, I think that any of these options may be appropriate. There could be other things that the commission would suggest. For example, should something, um, should it be more traditional? Should it lean more into an industrial look with punched openings um, and try and do something different with, with the porches? Or, for example, should it be less traditional? Should it try and be more modern? Should you know, they get rid of the band board and go for corner windows or ribbon windows or try something different with the fenestration to further differentiate the building? I think um, as a matter of design, it's already fairly well differentiated with what they're doing with the elevation and the massing. But so in that sense, staff finds that that gesture is appropriate. Whether or not it is really successful architecturally with the site, that's, that's what we're hoping to elicit comments from the commission tonight. So that concludes the staff's portion of the presentation. Again, the applicants and the architects have their own PowerPoint that I will be presenting out and they are here to answer your questions and I can take any questions as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ballo. I have a question mm -hmm. off the top. Um, the buildings may be relating to the Durwood Post Office, but what is the context as far as architecture around it of the same era of the post office and should we be should we be paying attention to that or influenced by that? That's an excellent question. I know that the applicant has in their PowerPoint. Um, and then also up, up here, I'm sorry, this is a little vertigo inducing. Um, there is not a lot of old Durwood left. It had been a turn of the century railroad hub. There was a really fine colonial revival style house that is two houses um, up Chieftain from this one that had been considered to be placed on the locational atlas and 
ultimately was not placed on the atlas. So there are there are modest vernacular farmhouses. There's that one really nice colonial revival style dwelling. There are some other bungalows. There was one other commercial building, another store that was demolished four years ago, right up the street. I think it was condemned. So the character of the site, so you can see here's the, here's the enclosed porch of the Durwood store. Right across the street is a, uh, a multi-family residential development uh, that I believe is completed and, and under occupancy now. It has stacked flats and townhouses. The, it, this is within walking distance to the Shady Grove Metro. This is looking down the street. There is an, is it a data center here? Is it an industrial building? Light industrial building here across the street, thank you. And um, the alley to the rear and then just other, it's a quiet neighborhood I would say. They got a lot of, um, well at, at one time they had gotten a lot of overflow parking from the metro as people were parking on the streets. Um, and then this is looking back down Chieftain. So this is the neighbor, the Colonial Revival house is to the other side of it. And this is looking back up the street. And then on the other side of the railroad tracks there is another, there is the old, um, there's an old church that is still a church, and there is a school. All of those sites were considered to be placed on the locational atlas and ultimately were not. So I would say immediately adjacent in the alley, it is low scale R200 residential, and then it immediately abuts industrial uses around the railroad track. So it is, um, it is a mixed use neighborhood. Thank you. Any other questions? This is Com Com Commissioner Doman. Um, for um, Supervisor Ballard, do you know, now I drove by this, the, <clears throat> in one of the early photographs, it showed the road, I guess it's, um, is it Durward Road or Chief Chieftain, I guess? Mm -hmm. It actually crossed the railroad tracks because there's a, there's, um, the crossing guards are shown there. And do you know when the road was terminated and it doesn't cross there anymore? And my other comment is there is a lot of traffic on there because right directly across the street is the Montgomery County Vehicle Inspection mm -hmm. um, Facility. And there are a lot of cars going in and out of there every single day. So there's a lot of traffic on that part, not exactly at the corner, but there's a lot of traffic on that road. So yes. uh, the question is, do you know when the road was, was closed off and is separated because of railroad tracks? I do not know the answer to that question, but I will definitely look it up for you and I'll have I'll have the answer the next time they come back. And you're absolutely right about the vehicle inspection center. Thank you for mentioning that. If, Thank you. Are any more questions or is that the extent of it? If, if that is the end of the questions, then our um, applicants are studying already. Thank you. Um, if you all identify yourself, make sure your mics are on and you can make your presentation. Uh, my name is Lawrence Smith. I represent CLW, which owns the, uh, the Redland store post office. Mm -hmm. um, sitting next to me is Michael. He's the architect for the project. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to do is just go through some, a couple quick slides. And then I'm going to let Michael take over because, again, we're here mainly for the design and the elevations of the project. Okay. Um, again, this is 15911 Redland Road. Um, we're here basically to find out, get more direction of where we go from here because we've been, we've been down several different paths and we're just trying to get some directions to keep moving forward because this project has been going on for, at least not with me anyway, like 15, 20 years. So it's been a long time. So if we can go to the next mm -hmm. one. Um, this is the back of the addition that was taken down. Um, we had, uh, as Ms. Ballow mentioned, you know, we wait for the Shady Grove Master Plan to be done. Uh, we had the real estate crash come down. Um, we had a lot of uh, the county and the neighbors, you know, they got on us also for to do something with the project, but we couldn't do so anything with the project because we didn't have the zoning, proper zoning. We didn't have, you know, nothing in the thing fit. So again, we got, you know, we worked with the, with the county. We did stuff we could. Uh, we worked with uh, Montgomery County historical staff. Uh, they let us take down the addition. We started replacing the roof. We went and did the sides. We went and did the foundation. The foundation has all been redone. The original stone foundation inside the walls have all been reshored. 
uh, new choices in two by four skin to the original structure. Um, mm -hmm. um, this is what it looks like now. Um, this is the back of the building. This, the, the vacant lot is where the addition is going to go. Right now, that's just a plywood and like a tart, um, a vapor barrier paper just to keep the rain off of the building. But it's just a vacant lot. It's all level. It's all clean. We cut the grass every couple of weeks and, you know, going through um, just trying to get everybody on the same page of stuff. Um, you can go to the next one, please. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, originally we started talking to Montgomery County Park and Planning. Um, and after talking to them back and forth, this is the Mark Park and Planning's concept plan that they came up with. Um, if you see the parking, the parking, they actually had, I think it was 12 parking spots in there mm -hmm. up on the top. Um, the original building, the addition stayed the same. They were okay with the massing and, and the structure, that kind of stuff. The addition and then the post office it naturally stays where it is. The problems we did have was the curb. The post office is about two foot off the street right now. So that we always knew was going to be an issue. But this is what um, Montgomery County Park and Planning came up with. So we started working on that. And then we got into uh, another um, suggestion along the way. If we can go to the mm -hmm. next one. Then they came up with this one. Um, again, they said they want a, they want a six-foot sidewalk. And how are we going to put a six-foot sidewalk in when we only have two foot from the street? It's going to be a little difficult. Um, they also had problems with the alley. The alley right now was originally 14 foot, and, the, and Park and Planning said, well, no, we need, I think it was 20 foot or 18 or 20 foot. So we had to change the parking lot. Um, they also wanted to put a bench in there, which we will put a bench in. We have stormwater management, we have to figure that out also along the way. And they wanted trees on uh, Durwood Road um, and then a tree over in, in Chieftain also. Um, the reduce the par they said they could reduce the parking because of the metro is also there. And there is parking on, the, on, on Durwood. There's plenty of parking on both sides of that, that street. We can go to the next one. Um, this is the verbal. This is the verbal site plan that they've said. They basically said, "Okay, we're okay with what we have right now." This site plan shows the curb is pulled out eight foot. We have a six foot sidewalk around as much as we can, and six foot green space. We've also changed the curb a little bit to jog, to jog back in, so they can park on the side on Durwood Road. Um, the alley has been cut to the regulations that parking planning. They stipulate in their regulations. Uh, the parking, I think, is six spots right now. And again, we still have the seating area, small sidewalk, um, two stormwater managements anyway. And we're also going to try and put a car charger in there um, for people if that have car chargers coming up. Um, but that's where we are right now. This is what the building looks like in the front of the building. Um, we haven't done anything. Um, every, we haven't done anything to the porch. The porch. Until we figure out exactly what everything else is going to happen, we weren't going to touch the porch. The porch will eventually be put back the way it originally was. It'll be a dummy porch because the way the floors are now, it doesn't line up with the porch. So it'll look like the house next door. It'll have a couple stairs that go up and the porch and the windows and a door, but they'll be dummy. It'll just be for show. Um, and this is where we are right now. Um, again, the, the, the Doorward Storm Post Office, it'll all be... Uh, German Dutch lap siding, wood siding. The roof has already been done. That's all individual tin roof. Um, that's been done. The porch will be back the way it originally was, and all that will be, you know, just like it was in 1900. The next part we have going forward is we need direction of where to go, a kind of positive or concrete direction of where to go. And I'm going to let Michael take over the rest, and we'll see, you know, if you have any questions and go, go back from there. Thank you. Mr. Grieg? Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Michael Gregg. I'm with 3G Architects. I've been working with Lawrence for the last couple of years on the project. Um, and I'm going to keep the presentation fairly short because we're just looking for comments back. Uh, Ms. Ballard did an excellent job as far as uh, describing um, what we're thinking about in uh, options A, B, and C. Um, Ms. Ballow, um, if you could put in A again for me, please. Sure, no problem. Just one moment. Pull that back up. Sorry. Ah. Actually, 
as she had mentioned, um, where we started with this uh, was playing off of the existing post office building, uh, the modest um, uh, facade fenestrations, materials, uh, placements, window sizes, those kinds of things. Because of the site restrictions, uh, we turned that uh, model 90 degrees uh, to front the street, uh, much like the post office does, and then try to uh, break down the massing uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is to break it up uh, almost in the same width as the existing uh, project. Uh, and because of the way the project, uh, the site works, uh, we were able to saw tooth the front to try to break that down, to bring it down to a more residential scale, even though we're using detailing for more, a more commercial, turn of the century, modest kind of feel. The front porches are modeled after the existing front porch with a very small spindle um, and a very uh, modest overhang. We have saw toothed uh, some of the detailing at the roof uh, because at the turn of the century, uh, there was some um, precedent for that. And also, what we're doing is trying to um, increase the roof size uh, on the south side so we can put some solar panels uh, and bring some modernity to it as well. Uh, trying to break up that modeling by using some color variation um, uh, helps break up that scale for the passerby. The, uh, in the back or the side elevation on the bottom right of this graphic, we've placed in the center uh, at the roof level a uh, fence line uh, or a screening uh, because we're going to be putting some, uh, we're flattening out a portion of the back roof area and placing the uh, air conditioning systems and those kinds of things up high on top of the roof so they're not down on the ground floor where people could see it. So we're screening that from the pedestrian as well. And then along the back on that same uh, elevation, we're trying to break the scale up uh, as well using different either material or color on that. Uh, can we go to sc uh, scheme B, please? In our conversations with Ms. Ballow, uh, talking about what does a turn of the century modest uh, commercial project in the Durwood area. What does that really mean? And so, you know, a lot of these commercial projects have flat roofs to them. Um, so we just tried a flat roof version. Uh, in that era, you always see a large um, uh, pediment area uh, entablature piece. So we've tried to mimic that a little bit here. Again, using the same cues of breaking it up with material and um, color. Uh, something I didn't uh, forgot to mention on this scheme and all the schemes, um, at the very base, as the building touches the ground, uh, we are um, uh, using a stone or brick uh, kind of feature uh, that is uh, whitewashed, uh, and that would match the uh, treatment of the main existing post office building and as it hits the ground. So we're trying to tie the two buildings back together. If we could go to uh, Scheme C. As Ms. Bellow mentioned, uh, the massing is still the same, but we've treated it differently by uh, doing blocking two sections together in color fashions. So it, this now looks like three buildings at end uh, versus six or smaller, so it changes the proportions and the perception along the street line. We still have the uh, extended roofs for the solar, and still have the same front pieces there. Um, one of the things that uh, Ms. Ballow uh, hasn't shown or you know, we haven't talked about is the previous designs that we've had. We've had more uh, designs that look like the uh, typical row homes that were across the street um, you know, that, that look more residential and, and trendy to today's um, aesthetics, but in our conversations, it was uh, let's let's take a look and let's step back a little bit and look at that uh, commercial um, modest approach and how do we get a village of these types of things together in the same sort of vernacular, but still have a contemporary flair to it. So uh, that's where we are. Uh, we're looking for some direction um, and uh, we're open to uh, feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Pelletier. 
Uh, thank you. Is the is the sawtooth footprint was that kind of prescribed by by what is it Parks and Planning? Who who are you working with? No, ma'am. Um, we started to look at this project and lay everything out, and because it is a pie shaped place, um, we showed a, uh, a, a sawtooth frontage to try to break down that massing because if we made it the same uh, angle as the street, it would be a massive building. Okay, so that, but that wasn't prescribed to you. No, it to wasn't, do it and, that but way. it was something right. that has been well received, so you'll see it in all the um, iterations. Okay, and then my other question is on the materiality. Is some of this brick on a couple of the, like I'm looking at, we're looking at C right now, but like on A and B, is the color differential is one brick and one siding, or have you not really decided? Is it more of just kind of a Well, we've been going back and forth on that. Some of the earlier schemes had uh, regular red brick sort of residential, and it was up higher. One of them went up to, one, up to the first story, and then it went hardy plank or siding or Dutch lap or something like that. But in these particular schemes, um, whether that's brick or uh, stone at the base level, and then above that, we've got siding and coloration. Uh, we're thinking hardy plank uh, for the siding because that is a cementitious uh, low maintenance material that matches um, on the side and in the back. Uh, once we got back away from the public realm, um, we at one point had some vinyl siding uh, to keep the cost down, but that's been rejected, I believe. So uh, okay. it's been... Um, Okay, so you're going back and forth. So you're kind of looking at masonry as a possible option and then siding as a possible option. It, like nothing's off the table. Nothing's off, nothing's off okay. the table, but in the current direction that we're looking at at this, um, uh, the, the Durwood uh, commercial modest plans, if you look at the details of the, in the historic uh, pictures that uh, Ms. Ballo and Lawrence and I have looked at, um, you know, there there's not a lot of brick in these buildings. They're wood structures. They're right. siding. There's they're not adorned a whole lot. You know, there's a fancy rake board at the top. You know, and and even when the siding comes down and meets the uh, in in the case of the post office, it is a, um, a it's a simple stone stack um, foundation. It's about two feet thick and it's about you know thirty six inches deep. It's, well, it's that's massive. And so they whitewashed it. So that's kind of where I'm going. Is I I, I just wonder if, if well, I mean, we can get into deliberations on this, but I was just curious about the masonry because it, as far as its relation to the existing building, but we can talk about that later. I just, I just wanted to find out if the footprint was yours or if it was something that you've had to work with. And also, it sounds like you're open to material choices, so we can discuss that during deliberation. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Doman, do you have a question yes uh, yeah, thank you um the question would be if you go with the right now we should we see the flat roof design and and the other ones you had uh, a gable roof so that you could put solar collectors on it can you would the flat roof also lend itself with the same amount of solar collectors as the, the uh, gable roofs were, were lend it uh, yes, we're planning on putting solar in in all three schemes. Uh, in the flat roof scheme, uh, you may or may not see it. You know, if we if we get the optimum angles on the solar panels, you might see it a little bit, but only in an elevation point of view. From the passerby person on the street, you probably wouldn't see it. You never see it, right? Oh, I think um, no, that's all I really have to say right now. Thank you. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Um, first off is is down by the parking lot, there was a seating area, but for each of these units, those porches look pretty look more like stoops just to get in their front door and then there's no back at all. So there's really no place for the residents to set outside and enjoy the outside while still being close to their property. Um, and 
it, I understand that the sidewalk is right there. There just really isn't a lot of space, but it, I, I don't see any attempt to uh, add a balcony in back or anything like that. This site is fairly tight. Um, mm -hmm. We're open to something uh, to that extent. Um, we do provide um, seating and a little park area off to the back parking area, um, uh, but we're open to doing something. Mm -hmm. But it's just we're just so tight on the property that it, we feel that if we bumped out or so, uh, with a balcony or something in the back or on the side, you can see along the neighbor's property. There's probably like five six feet there. Yeah, um, it was mentioned that there's a new development just across the road. Um, is this area going to? I mean, are, are there already other plans that you're aware of, or any expectations that it's going to develop very quickly with buildings very much like yours around it? So it'd be a much denser community than what it is now. I can answer that. Um, Chair Burdett, as part of the, the recently adopted sector plan, no, there are no plans. Um, the rest of the neighborhood maintains its R200 okay. zone. Okay. Oh, that's good. Um, and uh, I know this is early on, but again, going, kind of going back to green space, there's really not a lot of relief from elevation right up against anything. I mean, there's I see two areas where you can put some trees, to provide a little shade or relief, green relief. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Any other questions? Commissioner Galloway. I've got a question about, I've got a question about uh, what you don't see and it has to do with the connection that appears to be um, a second means of egress or egress out of the new construction. Is it connected? Is it intended to be connected between the two structures, the old post office and the new? Yeah, there's an open covered stair that's uh, meant to be as minimal as possible to keep a separation between the two masses. But that stairway is, is actually the connection into the post office uh, apartment units and uh, uh, the connection into the new additions. We're doubling up that use. Okay, and I think as we move forward, we'd like to understand that detail. It shows bit. on one of the elevations. Yeah, on yeah. the back, on the back elevation, on one of the I don't remember which option, but it's on one of the elevations, the back. Yeah, You're right there. Option there. C. There. All right. Uh, I'm sorry. I guess on option A. There we go. But it's the same stairs on all the options. So the cover is a flat roof, or what are you envisioning? Um, yes, we were uh, envisioning a flat roof as because we don't want it to interfere with the roof lines between the two buildings. Right. You know, we've got a historical building on one side. Yes, we're trying to look like and, and be a nice partner to that building, but we do have a modern building next to it. So we, we don't, we want to gingerly touch that building. Right. And the finishes would be more aligned with the new construction as opposed to trying to match a historic feature or what's your thoughts there? We're open to, to vocabulary, but in this particular image, um, if you look at the bottom right of this picture, uh, there on the, um, uh, on the porch, you know, you have that standard uh, picket uh, type thing. Um, we're showing something that's very similar to it in ours, but if the board feels like we would like cable rails because it is a nicer look and, and makes a distinction between the uh, historical building and the new building, we're open to that as well. Yeah, I'm, I was envisioning pressure-treated lumber or something that, you know, that I just would, you know, cringe at. So, so the fact that you're saying it's more like the porch on the, on the other side makes me feel uh, a little more comfortable with it. Again, what we're trying to do in this particular iteration is to, even though it's a modern take on it, it's still that um, commercial um, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to bring in a couple of details, size and scale, um, you know, yes, we don't have the same materials that they had back then, but we're going to try to be kind. Understand. Thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Burdett. Can you explain the on the historic property the three doors and how how the units work within? 
I'm not quite. Do you mean these three doors or the doors that would be accessed in the um, no, I, connecting? The ones that face the street. I mean, those were there, those were added for the apartments to the historic structure. Do they have to yes. stay? That, that is our understanding that they were added in the 1970s when that was when the building was chopped up into apartments. We do not consider those to be character defining features of this building. Staff is mm -hmm. agnostic, frankly, if they stay or go. We hadn't discussed that before, but in terms of you know how they may or may not be solving an access need for, we, for the historic yeah, we're building. Not, that's uh, we're not using those doors. They're strictly dummy doors from our, our, our point of view. Mm. Uh, we kept them because mm. they're there on the existing building. The apartment units are, are accessed from that stairwell uh, from the yeah. end of the building. Um, Commissioner Pelletier, go right ahead. I don't know. Did you have another question? Are you formulating? I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out the unit layouts oh, and okay. windows. How that the well, this sort of are. relates. Um, I Can you Sorry. talk about the, the front porch that's going to be a dummy porch? It kind of concerns me that there's a lot of these dummy doors on this thing, but you were talking about the the, the section differential between the front porch and the units. How much is it? Is there a section in here? I didn't see one. But can you sort of explain that relationship and why you decided that it's, it's not viable to use the front porch as a regular like front entry porch? Like, what's the height difference between the first floor and, and the Yeah, porch? it's about four, four and a half feet difference. So it's lo the, is the apartment lower or higher? The ground, the ground uh, unit is four and a half feet below the porch. And the, the, the next level up is four feet above that porch. So if we try to match the porch level, we're essentially throwing one floor away because we can't um, have two full floors, uh, or we can't get three floors out of that property, which is what was there originally. Okay, I don't fully understand. I don't, I mean, let me see if I yeah. can. I'm lost. Can I am we, too. Like if you had the porch, okay, original, but, and I'm going to zoom in, okay. I'm sorry, but maybe this this will help because I, I should have asked for a section as as well, and I've seen it. So, I, Michael, can you try and explain, or I can move the cursor to the the dash lines right at the cursor are the uh, the top line uh, of in that area is the floor line, and the dash line directly below that is the ceiling. But that's a new. That's the you new created that. No, that's existing. Well, we, we recreated it because uh, the historical uh, board asked us to uh, shore up the building. And so we cleaned out the insides and put the floors back where they were. So, so did the front porch, was it ever an entry? If it's always been that low? That, that's unclear. Um, oh, okay. Ever since we've had the property back in the 70s, uh, they may have changed it in the 70s, but we don't know. We don't have any record of where it I was see. prior. I see. Okay, so you, that first floor, you're just you just kind of worked with what was already there. Yeah. We had to take out the rotted wood and things like that. Oh, I know, that, but, but the we, level. But we put it back together. Yeah. Where it okay. Was. Okay, that's fine. I just, it's kind of a bizarre relationship, but it sounds like it's something that you inherited. So that's what I, that's why I was asking. Thank you. Commissioner Pelletier, um, this is Rebecca Ballow again for the record. It, it At the initial construction when this building was construction, constructed in 1904, yes, I, I can say confidently, that was a functional front porch. However, the post office and general store use did use portions of the basement. There, were, there was always a sort of really interesting relationship between the basement level and the first floor to accommodate these other commercial uses that made this unlike a typical house that, that you would see in Tacoma Park. And it's our understanding, at least looking at the site and the records, that these floor plates were, were chopped up and the front porch was enclosed at least as early as the, the late 1960s. So the 
Was the front porch kind of its own room that you accessed separately? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's just I don't so know, strange. To be honest okay, with you. that's fine. And we don't I, have good pictures of okay. the post office either. And it was, you know, it was not like it was. It was not like a typical post office where you would come in and do a lot of business like you do today. It was really just an enclosed little room right. that the postmaster that she was in that room and it was separated from her house in a different way too that was also separated from the general store. Oh, okay, so it probably maybe it had its own entry and it was just its own thing. Yeah, the post office is is actually located under the front porch mm -hmm. and it comes in <laughs> oh, from the yeah, side came and you actually can't get to the main building. It was its own little room. So you come in from uh, Durwood Road, there's one little room, yep. had a little desk, like and the postmaster sat there. behind it, had a little desk and some places to put cubbies and that was that was it. And you can actually, we have actually, once we've opened it up, we've taken pictures and you can actually still see most of the um, mill work and stuff. It's in bad shape, but you can see how it functions. Oh, interesting. But okay. yes, it, it, the post office is actually under the front porch. So strange. All right. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner Doman, are you, you have your hand is up. Yes, my hand's up. Right. Um, if I understand correctly now, <clears throat> the, um, the access to the units that's in the front, which is the old building, is through this staircase that connects the two buildings together, okay? But there's no real place to park. So I also note on your Durward Road, you had to bend the road out a little bit to get the wide enough corner to go around the end of the building of the old post office. But do you actually, what are you allowing maybe like four parking spots and that I guess that's my question do you, are you allowed enough places to park if you're going to have three units in the front of the old post office are you have do you have enough parking to support that and in the back according to the diagram it looks like you have maybe six parking spots in the back for the uh the, the new units that are coming in so are you a little bit short on parking for this area well, That's my question. originally we tried to get in 12 parking spaces. Um, and when they widened um, the uh, alleyway in the back, uh, it took out a lot. And uh, we need swales and bioretention ponds and places to sit outside, which are required from the county. So uh, when we had that conversation before, uh, because we're within walking distance of the metro, uh, with the uh, widening of the corner, we were able to get some street parking directly in front. Um, so we've got some street parking, we have some parking in the back, and we've got some relief because of the metro. So that's how we address the parking. How do you how do you how do you get to the metro from here? Do you have to go all the way back to the traffic light then? Or is there a shortcut underneath underneath Redland Road some way? You say this is one it's within walking distance, but it's it, it could be quite a ways. You go down to me. Chief, you go down Chieftain on to Redland, and then you make a left, and the metro's right over there. Right, right. But it, if you could go underneath, <laughs> it, it would be really be close if you could go underneath Redland some way. But I guess you can't. Yeah, not right now. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, any more questions from the commissioners? I have one more. I know Pelletier. I keep asking questions. This is Commissioner Pelletier. Are these going to be condos? Are they going to be rentals? What townhouses? Like, what is the? They're going to be condos. All of them, even the ones in the yes. in the old. So it'll be a condo regime that way because you have to keep the structure of the original post office, so it all all ties together. Because if you had individual units and people could do whatever they wanted to then there would be pandemonium. But if they're for sale. They're not be rentals. For sale, unless the economy crashes. And then we right, have and then they'll out. become but rentals. Right <laughs> now, they would be for sale. OK, great, thanks. All right, I think we're done with comments or, or questions for the applicant. So we're going to start our deliberations. Would anybody like to be the first to go? If not, I'm going to assign it to somebody. Commissioner Pelletier, you're always the brave one. Thank you. Since I'm so vocal about this project already, um, this is Commissioner Pelletier. Um, I, I, I feel like the facade is a bit too broken up on the new part. Um, I was looking at the 
first of all, I commend you for this project because I think it's really awesome that you're saving this building, um, which is super cool and old and deserves to be preserved. Um, but I feel like in the in the new part, it doesn't relate much to the old part. And I know you're trying with like the gable roofs and and breaking up the facade, but I feel like the facade doesn't need quite as many sawtooths as it has. And when I was looking at the different options, there's, I think it's C, the back facade of C, just kind of made me relax because it's, th it's three equal pieces and they're kind of the same width as the existing building and they, I feel like you could, if, if you wanted to go with the sawtooth thing on the, on the, the street side, I feel like three divisions give you that step back that you need, but it's not as frenetic as six. And so I just would like to put that out there that I really like this back facade of C. I think it's nice and quiet. It relates to the existing building. It doesn't compete with it. It's quite harmonious with it. The size of the openings is very similar, but you could do, you know, a more modern treatment with the with the materials. I also am not crazy about the brick because I think the only thing the brick really relates to is the new stuff that's on the other side of Chieftain. Um, and so I sort of wish that the that where you're going with the with the new um, residences would be a little bit more harmonious with the existing. Um, but I think you're on the right track. I just kind of wish it was three divisions instead of six because I think starting to break up the roofs and and that, that sawtooth setback thing, it's not super successful in places where I've seen it. Like there's a, a, a number of places in Silver Spring that have done this type of thing with commercial work, you know, stuff, not necessarily residential. But it, it doesn't have a great relationship with the street. And so I would like to see that kind of quieted down a little bit. And I also don't understand the doors I know it doesn't sound like the doors on the existing were particularly historically significant and that they may have been added later. It doesn't seem, and there are closets on the other side of the, of the wall. It seems like you could get rid of those and do something else on that facade. So I, those are the two things that kind of s jumped out at me um, that, but I, I think you're close. So I just sort of feel like it could the, the new stuff could be a little bit quieter than it is now. So those are my comments. Thank you. Uh, next volunteer. Somebody. Okay. Commissioner Haynes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I I uh, somewhat concur with. Um, uh, Commissioner Pelletier, and that uh, was uh, on the particularly the gable schemes, the the um, sawtooth along with the offsetting roof gable roof, um, somehow uh, felt very uh, zigzaggy, if you will. Um, I think I think the offset does work on option B, where the uh, I'm going to call it row house scheme. Uh, there, there, that that can work. I feel the offset can. I don't know if I would alternate the colors, um, as you've shown it there. I, I, I think that comes rather stripy in option B. I might do the ends in one color in the middle as another color, but but not alternating as you have. My when I first saw the schemes, I. I Kind of was leaning towards option B, and perhaps the roof line, the cornice line, could be brought down a little bit. It looks like it's higher than 
the uh, historic resource, and um, I would look to, to, to bring that down. Um, don't be doing shutters either. <laughs> um, it's not, not uh, unless you're going to do real shutters. But, but, um, um, but going back to, you know, I've kind of come full circle with option C in terms of the color scheme. I think the um, block of color as option C represents works better than the alternating uh, every, every zigzag. Um, um, maybe the window fenestration, I wouldn't mind seeing if, uh, we, you know, it's always a difficult thing because we want it to relate to historic resource, but yet we often want it to, to uh, stand on its own. Uh, and so maybe the fenestration, uh, the type of windows that you use or how they're either the size or grouping could be altered to, to give it a more contemporary industrial look. Um, um, material wise, I thought the, doesn't the historic resource, does it have brick or is it a stone? I, I'm a little confused about that. Does the historic resource have a stone foundation? Stone. But the photographs look like it was a white concrete. It, it's, it's parched and whitewashed. It's parched and whitewashed, I got it, okay. Um, so then maybe maybe that that uh, brick base would also be parched and whitewashed to match as you as you noted um, to tie it together that way. Um, I, I don't think vinyl should be used. I don't think you're going to get longevity, but it's not appropriate. Um, I'm okay with with hardy plank and and composite trim and and so forth. I think that's that's fine too. I'm still trying to resolve my mind if the roof, gable roof offsets is working or not. Um, I'm not, not sure it's needed for the solar panels. Maybe it is, maybe it's not, but um, maybe if we saw examples of, of historic buildings that, that do that. I know, I know in the industrial commercial buildings uh, have a somewhat similar roof, but it's more pronounced. The, the offset is more pronounced so that you can get light into into industrial spaces here it seems more forced maybe it's because of this the offset uh the uh, of the of the facade that the roof offset helps make that transition but um i am supportive of the project i applaud that you are uh uh um, developing the land that you're preserving the historic resource so so that's that's a really great thing and 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 you should be commended for that um um, I thought the rear facade, and I know we're trying to maximize the, the interior space, um, would be nice if there were some relief to the back facade. I know it's an interior neighbor adjoining and not a public facade, um, um, but, but it is a big, may, maybe it's bringing the roof line down would help uh, as, as well if that's, that's possible. Um, I know I'm throwing a lot of little tidbits out at you. I mean, generally, I think y you're heading in the right direction. Overall, you're heading in the right direction. I think it's a matter of refinement. And I guess if I had to say what scheme do I prefer, um, <laughs> quite honestly, it's a toss-up between um, B and C, but I guess I'm really leaning towards C myself, so with, with some refinement. Thank you, Commissioner Haynes. Uh, Commissioner Zara, thank you. Uh, this is Commissioner Nasser. I, I'm going to keep it short. I kind of agree with Commissioner Haynes and uh, Politier. Uh, if you, uh, my opinion is, if you're trying to keep the sawtooth, um, I would definitely do the flat roof with, with that, with that division, because the um, gable and shed roof created an unusual uh, kind of corner. Um, but if you go back to the wider uh, kind of division and keeping three bays, um, I think the they, some kind of gable would work. Uh, Material-wise, I would keep just three materials. Uh, even if you break the bays to six bays, I would keep uh, option three kind of materials to provide three buildings with three identities. Um, 
Uh, I guess, um, yeah, that's, I mean, Commissioner Haynes kind of point out all the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in general, I, 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 I am familiar with the neighborhood and I think this is a very nice addition to the, especially that close to the metro, it's very nice. You usually just see very high, like, you know, five, six story apartments next close to the public transportation and this is a very nice to, that provides diversity for people uh, close to the metro. Thank you, Commissioner Nasser. Commissioner Doman, you have your hand up. I do. Um, just to, <laughs> to be as sure as I can, <clears throat> I don't have too much more to offer. I do, uh, I like the size, I like the massing. Um, I agree with um, uh, Commissioner Haynes. Um, I, I prefer option B. I think the uh, flat roof, I think, solves some of the problem with the jaggedness and the irregular look that you get from the street. I think a flat roof in option B looks the best. Um, and I, one of the other questions before us on the HBC was whether or not some of these, um, the use of Hardy Plank and or AZAC would be appropriate. And I'm all in favor of using that for this edition. I think that'd be fine. Um, as far as the shutters, I agree with Commissioner Haynes. We don't need to put shutters on, on these buildings. I think they look fine otherwise. And I think that um, the, the painting scheme in option C where you have the, the first one all one color, the second one all one color, the third one all, all one color, I think that looks best. And uh, I guess my main concern is parking. I don't see where you're going to get all these people to park, but um, I guess whoever buys that or buys into this will have to solve that problem uh, when they get there. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Doman. If there are no more comments, then I'll go last. Commissioner Galway, please. Thank you. Your first Galway. time. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like what the industrial look of the flat roof. It, if it wasn't adjacent to the old, um, uh, the old um, post office, I think I like that. I, it, it really sets. It's a nice vision. But I think because we have the existing building with with the uh, you know, with the pitched roof. I like what you're doing with option C in rotating the buildings, replic replicating or, or simulating the same width with, with the eave. Uh, I, I kind of like it, but the sawtooth is get, gets busy. And especially when you've got the, the, the three uh, eaves and then you've got the, the jutting sections halfway on the front, it, it gets very, very busy. So one thing it might, might, might be worth looking at is under option C, is there something you could do with the middle one to, to still replicate, to have the two that replicate the, the cross section of the old post office, but then maybe there's an opportunity to, to bring the roof across where you're not getting the sawtooth as much as you are getting having the two peaks with, with maybe it's a dormers and a, and, a, and a roof that comes across. I don't know if you've looked at that, but it might be something to look at. Um, uh, uh, just because of up on the screen on the bottom right is the uh, side of the building, and that's mm -hmm. something similar to what you're talking mm -hmm. about, I believe. Yes, yes, similar to that on the front side. It might break up that sawtooth. Uh, if I, I'm sure you're trying to maximize the square footage in the spaces, it would be great if the three buildings, if you could off, uh, if you didn't offset um, each of the three, um, you know, it, it might be easier to, to really, maybe simpler in terms of the complexity of all the offsetting something that you know might be worth looking at um i i i like others here i think the, the idea of the base with the plank uh i think is is a good um, sort of complement to the existing post office i think the brick not so much because if this had if the existing post office uh, store had had brick in it then maybe but i think the plank i'm i'm sort of leaning leaning towards liking that a little bit more um I, I think the three colors, um, it, once I get past the mustard color of the one, and, and you know, I think it has to be something uh, other than that. But, but I do think the idea of the three colors, I, rather than having a scheme where you're alternating colors, I, I prefer that. Um, um, and I think that's pretty much all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Galway. Welcome to the commission. <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to finish up tonight. Um, and I agree with just about everybody else that option C is probably the better one of them. 
And I agree with all the comments about the sawtooth and the colors that, you know, the, for, for people who will be in these places, their units will be reflected on the outside. And if you've got these narrow vertical bands of color going up that separate their unit into basically two colors on the front, it's going to make their unit, it's going to look like a unit that's too narrow to be functional. So I would keep, as everyone has said, keep the units on the exterior to the same color. Um, I, it might be worth looking at some traditional townhouses, row houses in DC, where they have a bay window, a, a protruding bay a projection on the front, but that projection is on the ground floor, actually a, a covered or enclosed entryway. Um, since these porches aren't going to be terribly functional, you might as well make the best out of them. Um, but enough of that. My issue is really over at the older building, and I have two big issues with that. First off, I don't think it's worth keeping the dummy doors if you're not going to use them as a door. Um, get rid of them or, and allow that upper space to be a window. That bottom unit's a little spare on windows. But I think replicating something that wasn't on the historic building and then not using it doesn't make any sense at all, and it doesn't help the appearance. It, it makes it look um, like it's a, a, a flop house. A movie set. Or a movie set, yeah. You confuse the trick-or-treaters. Yeah, exactly. Well, that too. Yeah, you're going to have to, they're going to have to put signs on their door, not trick or, no trick-or-treaties. Um, and I also have, I have a problem with the loss of the porch. I, I, for, for a site that has so little outdoor area for the residents, um, where your, your only seating area is next door to, is a, immediately adjacent to their parking lot, and then you have this front porch setting there that's not usable, and I don't know how you're gonna secure it from strangers walking up on it if there's no door there to signify this is someone's private place. Maybe you wanna look at that, the un, having a stacked unit at that end to use the porch to work a stairway to work with that porch on the interior of the space might be something to consider, but I just don't understand having, you have to have the porch, it's historic, and then ignoring it and leaving it out there just makes no sense to me. Um, and my other concern is this stair that is shared by both buildings. Um, it unfortunately looks very much like the kind of, of open air, utilitarian stair that you will find on older buildings that are, I, I keep thinking of like, are in university districts or, you know, uh, low rent districts where it's just the most minimal stair to get people up to their units. Um, these are condos. These people are going to be walking up those stairs to their units they own, and it's a minimal structure, not enclosed. There's no elevator. Um, if, if there's no protection from the weather, then when it ices and snows, they're gonna be going up that stairway to get to the unit they bought. I'm not sure about that. I, I appreciate what you're trying to represent, but it's gonna have to work and it can't look um, a, a flimsy or, or unstable, especially in inclement weather. Um, I, I just don't understand that one at all either. Um, so I think with my comments kind of being the downer at the end of the session, um, I think you've had plenty of comments, a lot of comments um, from, we have, uh, uh, as we like to say, one of the best uh, aspects of, the eight, of these preliminary uh, consultations is you get a lot of good advice from a lot of good, experienced, and talented people on the, on the commission, um, whether they're architects or historians or planners. Uh, there is a lot of experience setting up here and it's worth paying attention to what we've said. The staff will provide you with a list of our comments uh, in a more coherent fashion than we've delivered them. Um, and again, we all support this project. We're all very happy to see this wonderful historic vernacular building being adaptively reused. Uh, and support the additional housing that will be available in a growing area. Um, so uh, 
we look forward to you coming back, hopefully, with a project that can go, a, a set of documents that can go straight into the hop if staff allows. So thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, moving on. We are moving on to preliminary 3B, 46 Grafton Street, Chevy Chase. And I understand there will be a staff report, but I understand there are no applicants presenting tonight, correct? That is correct. So this is the preliminary consultation staff report for 46 Grafton Street, Chevy Chase. It's the building that you see in front of you. It was constructed circa 1928. It's a contributing resource to the district. Uh, this is to be reviewed under Chapter 24A, the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and the Chevy Chase Village Historic District Design Guidelines. So the applicant proposes to paint the exposed brick exterior of the house. Um, buildings in the surrounding district include a wide variety of of exterior finishes and uh, a brief survey of most of the block uh, follows. So mostly what you, this is sort of walking from Chevy Chase Circle towards the end of the block where the subject property is. So we've got lots of, uh, it's a very eclectic block um, with a wide variety of styles, um, architect design houses, multiple finishes, uh, a lot of stucco exterior that's clabbered, it's sort of hard to see. Um, again, we now get another shingle-sided house, stucco, more stucco, stone, stucco, and shingles, uh, clabbered siding, more stucco. This is a unfinished brick, non-contributing resource that was constructed in uh, circa 1948. Um, again, more stucco. Um, it's actually aluminum siding, clabbered and stucco, shingle siding, more stucco, shingles and stucco, another aluminum siding, more stucco. This is actually the next door neighbor house. It is painted brick. Uh, again, the subject property ends the block. And then um, moving up along Cedar Parkway, we have another painted brick house. Uh, this house, which is shingle and brick, the brick was painted. Um, a Tudor Revival house with a, a brick ground floor also painted. This is 26 Hesketh. Um, so the, the, the brick siding is painted, but not the chimney. So you can see what the original yellow brick of the house. Um, and then this is uh, 34 West Kirk Street, which was a house that uh, actually received a hop to lime wash its exterior. Uh, it was brick. So obviously, I, uh, we've identified several other houses in the vicinity of the subject property that were painted brick. Um, actually, a, a majority of the houses that were brick uh, had been had exterior painting. Um, staff was only able to identify a hop to paint 34 West Kirk. All of the other houses were painted prior to any of our records. I, I did do, um, I used Google Street View to find uh, old, some older images, not historic, but older images of, of all of those houses and, and they were all painted going back as far as um, the early 2000s. Again, this district was established in 1998. Um, staff finds that it was common for Colonial Revival houses to have painted brick exteriors. But staff also finds that painting unpainted masonry is not a recommended preservation treatment. Uh, what you see in front of you is taken directly from uh, the illustrated guidelines and standards for rehabilitation where it says applying paint and other coatings such as stucco to masonry that has been historically unpainted or uncoated to create a new appearance. So again, not a recommended treatment. Additionally, um, painting masonry exterior can be harmful to the surface. Uh, it can create a vapor barrier that traps moisture inside the brick and cause spalling or brick crumbling on the exterior or mold growth or mildew growth on the interior. Um, it's also not a reversible treatment. So removing paint thoroughly is almost um, 
assuredly going to cause damage to that brick surface. So were, the, were this to come in as a hop, uh, the staff would recommend the HPC deny under standards 257 and 24A8B1, and uh, I believe I forgot to add B2, which was in the staff report. Yes, and, and B2, which is in the staff report. Um, so for tonight's discussion, primarily uh, staff request feedback on the appropriateness of the proposed work. Uh, the HPC could, of course, not agree with staff's recommendation. Um, with 34 West Kirk Street, uh, there was a link to that staff report in um, this staff report, and they submitted documentation from an architect, additional photographs that detailed um, the problem that the proposed lime wash was addressing. Um, additionally, if there are any specific recommended products or treatments that the HPC would like to recommend, and any additional comments. Uh, just lastly to add, um, the applicant in their, in their application indicated that the proposal was to color it agreeable gray, which is a Sherwin-Williams product. So uh, there are, you know, w within that product line, they do offer um, what they call the, the Loxon, um, which is a, a masonry paint. It's intended to be more breathable, but it is still um, an acrylic latex paint. And with that, I will answer any questions that you have, and um, otherwise we can open it up to discussion. Commissioner Haynes, you have a question. Um, yes, what, what is the motivation? Is, is it purely aesthetic by, by the owners? Um, are there issues with the brick, uh, so condition of the brick that might? Right, the applicant didn't provide any, any other details um, as to the motivation for it. Um, you know, in the staff report and in, in reaching out to the applicant, we identified another instance where the HPC reviewed it and, and approved it at why. So, you know, my, my best guess is that this is an aesthetically driven choice. Um, and, and the brick, um, is, is there any historic uh, significance about the brick? Is there, did it come from a local uh, quarry brick manufacturer? I mean, it's a very nice brick in that it has depth, it has uh, um, um, depth in color and a variation in color. So it's a, kind of a classic traditional brick in that sense. And I didn't know if, it, if there was any um, um, from a local supplier or 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 a manufacturing brick company that that might lend to the historic significance of of the house so i mean the house was constructed in the late 20s so odds are the brick was at least regionally sourced um our records don't include any information about that but perhaps the chevy chase village historical society might um so we would need to reach out to them to examine their records to see if they had any more information about that. Thanks. Any other questions for staff? If not, we'll start our, oh, Is Commissioner, Commissioner Doman. Radu. Doman. And Commissioner uh, Radu, Doman good, gets to go first, thank you. I'll get to you next. You don't have any information about the mortar joints or anything. Is there any issue with that? I mean, I, I mean, I, again, no, no information was, was, no additional information was provided in the application. So. Um, you know, based on my own observations, I didn't see any significant mortar degradation, but I didn't, you know, examine all four walls of the house. And um, so, so it's, it's entirely possible, but, but again, that's uh, one of the questions that if uh, the HPC decides that additional documentation is warranted, uh, what form you'd like to see that take um, is, is another um, is, is one of the potential you know, outcomes of, of this preliminary consultation. As you don't need to decide um, on the merits this evening, it, it's um, you know, what additional information you would need to see to make that consideration. Commissioner Doman. Actually, my question was answered. I have no more questions, thank okay. you. If there are no more questions, we'll start our deliberations. Would anybody like to start off? And if you want to keep your comment to the bare minimum, you may. Yes, Commissioner Clements, please. This is Commissioner Clements. Uh, I 
appreciate that staff uh, saw that there was a, a sort of deeper philosophical discussion to be had here, and thus I can understand why this was brought forward as a preliminary. However, I must uh, concur with staff's first instinct that this is just simply inappropriate. Um, I, I feel sorry for this, uh, this homeowner that they live on a street with people that painted their brick when that was an available option. It is not now. It is laid out in the clearest possible language that it is not acceptable. And unless there is a, a valid preservation reason that this person, uh, the homeowner, would like to bring forward at a later date uh, that specifies in the clearest possible language that painting this brick is necessary, I just cannot imagine an earthly reason why we, we would accept this. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Clements. I, uh, Commissioner Haynes. <laughs> Ditto. I, 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 I agree 100%. Uh, you, uh, Commissioner Pelletier, you may ask your question of staff. Okay. Uh, can you go into a little bit of detail about the one house that did get the hop, that did get approval for paint? Sure. So it's, it's the subject property here. This is 34 West Kirk Street. Um, it was a 2019 hop. I actually can have the link to that, but I did not. Um, was this the one with the... They were going to do that railing. So yeah, yeah. This was this was actually um, a photo I pulled from the railing hop. Um, so their their problem um, was both um, salt leaching and some spalling, and that was thoroughly documented by their architect. And um, their proposal was to lime wash the building, which would stabilize that, and um, was actually a, a best practice for, for responding to that. So um, reluctantly, the staff supported approval of the HOP and um, the HPC concurred with, with staff's reasoning. Actually, uh, the Supervisor Ballow and I were, were discussing earlier today um, what a shame it was because this house was so, adorable. yes, ad adorable, but also dark and sort of of the earth and and really like arts and crafts, and now it's light and bright and um, while still attractive, it really lost its sense of time and and its um, design intent. Agreed. And but it, there was spalling and there was damage to the brick. Yes, and so that was that was presented in a letter signed by the project architect. So we had. Um, not a disinterested third party, but at least a third party provide that documentation. Right. And in that case, you know, if you're trying to replace the brick, you never quite match right. it. It's never, you know, that's always a reason to paint. But I mean, I have to agree with everybody else. I don't, I don't see why. The, the, the brick on this house is beautiful. Um, you know, when I did a drive by, it's, it's so uh, I cannot support this hop. Thank you, Commissioner Pelletier. It's not quite a hop yet. It's <laughs> it's still a preliminary, but we take your your opinion. Um, any other comments, Commissioner Radu? Just to agree with not not supporting the painting, and we will lose a lot of the detail, the lintel. I mean, that will not read through the facade through the paint. And if that is it, then I'm going to end the comments. Uh, Commissioner Doman, did you give comments? Or, uh, or uh, deliberate? No, I'm, I'm all, I'm, I agree. Okay. Nothing else to add. Okay. Um, and I'll close out that I concur completely with Commissioner Clements. Very well put comments. I would not support this hop painting this house. It's beautiful brick, and uh, it would not be at all appropriate um, to do this, to, to paint the, this contributing resource. Uh, and with that, if staff will let that applicant know our, our opinion, strongly voiced opinions, um, then that is the end of the preliminary consultations. And we can move on to item number four, tax credit group number uh, six and final transmittal vote, which I guess is not actually happening, happening correct? 
Uh, correct. There won't be a, a final transmittal vote uh, because there are two outstanding tax credits that we're waiting for a little more information on. Uh, however, Group 6 included 21 projects and $806,802.97 of uh, eligible expenses to be sent to the uh, Department of Finance. That is wonderful. Thank you. Minutes for the meetings for October 12th and 26. Yes, Madam Chair, we have both of these meeting minutes for your review and approval. Um, did would anybody who read them like to make a motion to approve them? Did any? Hey, this is Commissioner Doman. I have read the minutes and I move that we approve the draft minutes of the October 12th, 2022 Montgomery County Historic Preservation Commission meeting. And the other one is, if I get this straight, the 26th. Also, I move that we approve the October 26, 2022 draft minutes of the Historic Preservation Commission. Do I have a second to that motion? This is Commissioner Clements, who also read the minutes, and I second. All in favor say aye. 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 And thank you, Commissioner Doman. Uh, other business, commission items. Um, I guess we're going to take our one item and push it off onto a staff item, correct? Okay, then on to staff items. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, two items on the agenda and one that is not on the agenda. Um, First, we have the approval of the 2023 meeting calendar. We put this in your commission board books at the October 26th meeting, um, and we are just asking for your consent tonight to advertise these meeting dates for the upcoming calendar year. Uh, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed to this? Aye. <laughs> Great. Then yes, please advertise these dates. Thank you. The second item, I mentioned this briefly in our work session. The county executive's office has promulgated some guidance on open meetings and text messages. So I passed that around to everybody for your perusal. Commissioner Doman, I will email that to you separately and I will also email it to Chair Sutton who is not with us tonight and we will also update it we will also add it to your board books. Thank you. Thank you. Our, Thank you. our third item is um, an update on the Weller's dry cleaning site at 8237 Fenton. That came to the HPC in September where the HPC recommended that the site be listed to the Locational Atlas and Index of Historic Sites. And then it was scheduled to be heard at the planning board on October the 27th. We did not have a planning board <laughs> on October the 27th. Um, or, they, or the new planning board had just been sworn in. The planning board meetings after, the, I think it was the first one in October, were all canceled. They were all canceled after the planning board resigned in mid-October. We missed two, maybe, maybe three meetings. Um, and we were working to reschedule that with the new planning board. Um, in, the, in the interim, a new tenant has fitted out the site um, and has painted the building, painted the building white, all of it, except for the, um, the stone, the kind of rusticated stone at the northwest corner of the building and the owner, the tenant, we're not 100% not sure who, who actually did it, um, put in a new business sign and removed the, the portion of the sign boxes that had identified the old Weller's dry cleaning. So we are scheduling this to come back to the HPC at your next December 7th meeting. We're just going to move ahead with the master plan designation. Um, we don't want the master plan designation to get off schedule because of the, um, the delay with the planning board scheduling, which was due to, you know, 
things things happen. Um, some, some, sometimes a lot of things happen all at once. Um, so we're scheduling this to bring it back to the HPC at your first December meeting as the public hearing and work session for the master plan amendment. And then to get to get everything back on schedule so you have an idea of the, the work program that, that we have planned out for our master plan amendments for the next couple of years, we had scheduled to come to the planning board in January or February with a joint master plan amendment for the Edward U. Taylor School and the Wellers dry cleaning site. So we are holding to that schedule without the intervening step of going back to the planning board to ask for a locational atlas listing. We're just gonna stick with the work program. Here it is a master plan site hearing at HPC on December the 7th, and then get it scheduled as soon as possible for the planning board to consider both sites to be listed to the master plan for historic preservation, probably in late, late January, early, early February, looking at the calendar. We will be posting an updated staff report the week before the hearing, which is essentially in the, nec in the next two weeks. Um, st staff, it, and this will be up to the HPC to deliberate to find if you still, if, if you still find that it meets the two designation criteria, or the designation criteria that staff initially identified. We believe that it does. Um, we believe that the essential form and architecture of the building remain unaltered. And while the portion of the signage that identifies you know, Wellers as a business um, that had some really wonderful design aspects to it, while that is gone, there is still the, the framing of the sign mm -hmm. itself. With the, there's still the clock, the, you know, the circle, the triangle, the rectangle that still exists. The form is still there. I, I don't want to go into it too much more because this is not a deliberation on that item, but that that's where we think our report is going to go. Um, Ms. Ballow, is the, does the staff um, believe that the building can be restored to its original appearance? What I can do is speak generally mm -hmm. about well, you've you've heard a lot, and you guys and the commission are are experts on paint removal from <laughs> from masonry. Um, there was just a, a robust deliberation about that. I can speak with some experience about removing paint from porcelain, steel, enamel. It can be done. It is similar to car detailing, hmm. more more or less. I've seen you know rust removed. It's not it's not the same. Um, and it really depends. I don't. We don't know what type of paint was used, so that that is certainly an open question. I don't know. I believe it could be the case that painted brick and porcelain steel could be remediated at this site. I do not know. And has there been an update from the Department of the Environment on the sampling and approval that the building is safe? There has not been an update um, per my discussions with the staff at MDE. They were expecting updated samples from the property owner tomorrow. Thank you. Well, that concludes all of the staff items for this evening. If there are, if Commissioner Haynes? Just real quick. Um, Karen and I attended the Montgomery Preservation Awards, uh, was that two weeks ago mm -hmm. or so? Yeah. And um, there was an impressive um, uh, 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 candidates and, and the diversity of projects was really impressive. And uh, uh, so I was pleased with, with uh, the, uh, the nominations and, and um, was an interesting evening. So just wanted to throw that out there for everyone. Well, on the Montgomery Preservation Inc. website, oh, okay. um, and there's also a, a movie or a PowerPoint of, I think it's actually a movie this time, um, of the different nominees and the buildings. And 
Yes. yes. Yeah, she worked on this one too. So, oh. yeah. Cool. So she's, so yeah, so it was very good. Um, also, Sunday I got to attend the um, Art Deco Society of Washington's 40th anniversary. Um, they've done a lot of preservation work in the D.C. area and also had the opportunity, opportunity to meet some other preservation uh, people from D.C. and Virginia, uh, including a commissioner from Alexandria. So that was fun to sit there and commiserate and share. Uh, what is it? What do we call them? The good, bad, and evils? Or good, bad, and, good, bad, and uglies. Yeah. <laughs> if there are no more comments or contributions, then this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>